good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is, wherever you are right now. Thank you for tuning in to the Conversations with Dr. Don Show. The show is produced and broadcast from the Portland, Oregon area. Now, for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and about what we've de decided to talk about tonight. So tonight, we'll talk mostly about two real do-gooders in today's world, two real do-gooders in today's world, and here they are right now. And uh, our guests this evening are Todd Kaufman, sitting to my right here. How are you feeling, Todd? Good. Who told you? I know. <laughs> and my other guest is Brad Vollmer. How are you feeling, Brad? Wonderful. 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 <laughs> Thank you for coming on. Okay. Thank you for having me. And as you know, our show goes in two major segments, the bio segment, where I interview my guests about who they are personally so you have an idea where they're coming from when they say things in the second half of the show about do-gooders. And uh, the second half of the show will be examples of doing good on the part of each of our guests as they, they talk to me about doing good. And I know about doing good because I did bad many times ago. But I won't compare with you so far for what you told me before the camera started rolling. But anyhow, let's start off with you, Brad. Uh, uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Spokane on the air base. My uh, father was in the Air Force, and so I was born uh, up there in Spokane, and then we moved to Portland right away. Uh -huh. uh, my father's father was a Portland police officer. Yeah, and why were you born? Uh, it was my purpose. I had to incarnate at this particular juncture for this event to occur. Uh -huh. You incarnated, what does that mean? Uh, I'm embodied. I I chose to become here uh -huh. in the flesh. You chose. Wow, you got some far out thinking there. I come to this conclusion after my life. There's been too many wrecks for me to still be alive for not to be a purpose. Okay. Now, anything significant about your cultural heritage or your racial or national heritage, or you just painted a painted American white bread? Uh, yeah, stale white bread. Stale white bread. I never <laughs> heard that one before. <laughs> well, it's a joke I have with my Latino brothers that had I not been in prison, I would still be a stale piece of white bread. But being in prison gave me an opportunity to sit, eat, and break bread with people of all cultures. And we're going to talk some more about your time in, in prison. But uh, continuing with my questions, do you have a religious preference nowadays? I'm spiritual. But what does that mean? Spiritual? That means that religion are for people that, for me, that are afraid of hell, and spirituality are those that have been there. Uh -huh. So you've been in hell. Uh, wow. And we'll hear more about that too as we talk and more about your spiritual awakening. life. Yeah. Awakening, yeah. And uh, when you were a little kid, did you have a religion then? They, I remember three times distinctly going into a church and throwing temper tantrums. As soon as the minister would start to speak, I would freak out. Mm -hmm. And so after the third, they finally realized that church wasn't going to be for Brad. But you kept going two years, two years, and then finally you arrived at where you are right now as a do-gooder. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's absolute. God got me here another way. You mentioned about uh, your education. You took your education in prison? I started it in, in prison, and then I uh, had I had four years in prison and four years in the community. Mm -hmm. it took me eight years of higher education to get my bachelor's, but I also learned a, a lot of other things along the How way. How is it that you learned to, to become educated in prison, and then you proceeded to do it? Uh, because they said I couldn't. They said, said that I was. Could. They said that I was just uh, incorrigible. Yeah, uh, I was worthless. Okay. That the fact that they were feeding me, I should thank my lucky stars because I was destined to do nothing but fill prison cells the rest of my life. How did you get to believe that when you were that young that you were worthless? 
Uh, adults kept telling me that. When did you discover that you were worth something? Uh, it's been in the last probably 92. A lady by the name of Leah Sauer. Mm -hmm. This is how I got into Seven Step. Mm -hmm. I had already completed my degree and I had nine more years to do before I was even eligible for release from the penitentiary. Uh -huh. So to do something, I figured I'd check out Seven Step. You so know, it's about change. Say a little bit about Seven Step. What is that about? Seven Step, uh, being Seven Steps, the first step is facing the truth about yourself and the world around, or you say facing the truth about ourselves and the world around us, we decided we needed That's to change. That's the first step. That's the first one. Uh, how about the next step? Second one is realizing that there's a power from which we can gain strength. And we are using that, that power. Absolutely. I didn't at first. I didn't understand it. Uh -huh. You know, this is my first introduction. The third one, evaluating ourselves by taking an honest self-appraisal, we examine both our strengths and our weaknesses. Contrary to some, uh, like NA or AA, where the first premise is that you're weak, that you're an addict, and that's all you'll ever be. So you follow those steps, and you follow those steps until you got to the point where you realized, pardon me, that you have some worth. There is worth. Wow. And then we, uh, the next step is enlisting the aid of that power. We enlisted the aid of the power to help us concentrate on our strengths, to overcome our weaknesses. Those weaknesses aren't who we are. Those are just things that are holding us back. Uh -huh. The next step is deciding that our freedom is worth more than our resentments. We're using that power to free us from those resentments. Okay. The next one is observing that daily progress is necessary. We set obtainable goals toward which we can work each day. And the last, and I think is important, is maintaining our own freedom. We pledge to help others as we have been helped. And as the time went by, you realized more and more of these steps you were working through. And practicing and, uh, and involved in daily life. Was there ever a time when you reached a certain step where you say, hey, this is different now than it was when I first came in here? Yeah, it made more sense. Mm -hmm. Where before I thought I was uh, just a parrot. You know, we were going through these motions. But then you had to do the time. Yeah. But then you got permission to get educated. What the heck oh, where did that come from? At one time, there was uh, in the prison and the peniological uh, thinking that an education might help. And they've mm -hmm. now learned that an education is the most effective tool in reducing recidivism. So if you want people to stop going to prison, give them an education, give them some hope and examples. See, Leah Todd was an example that, that I was okay. I needed human beings, I needed civilians to come in and talk to me because I was surrounded by convicts and cops that just reinforced the conclusion that I was a loser. Do you remember about uh, a certain person that had some significant influence on you to have you realize what you're saying right now, yeah. that I am worthwhile? Leah. Leah. Leah Sauer, uh, it was my very first meeting. She came and sat next first to me. First meeting. She came, sat next to me, and uh, wanted me to explain who I was. And I told her, well, you really don't want to know me because I've done bad things, I hurt people. Uh -huh. And she sighs and pats me on the knee and says, son, you're confused. She goes, that's not who you are, that's what you did. And you believed her? Oh no, I got mad. I thought, who the hell are you to tell me what I am? And, but I couldn't be rude because there's a guest, so I had to keep it quiet. But I thought about it. <clears throat> the next meeting, two weeks later, she came again, and she wouldn't leave me alone. <laughs> and thank God, because she's what helped me become who I'm becoming today. And you're laughing about it now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I was pretty tied up with this idea of who I was. You know, I thought I was an outlaw, and I was a mobster, and I was all these bad things that was painted and, and written, but that's not who I but am. But she gave you hope. More than that, she gave me life. Uh, uh -huh. She gave me hope and, and a new way of seeing Brad. When did you decide that you liked her? Mm, within a month. You know, she was mom, she adopted me. So yeah, it was pretty quick. <laughs> well, you were susceptible <laughs> to being uh, 
learning yeah. what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what did you do? Do you have any employment outside of prison? Well, due to my past actions, I was not able, my, my, my parole conditions when I got out in 2001, uh -huh. is I was not to work around money. I was a, what they call a safe Pete. I opened safes, I compromised alarm systems and went into jewelry stores when they were closed and would relieve the safes of their content. How come you were so smart? Basically, you were given some brains. That's what the judge said, and I'd misused them. But up until then, right, all the adults in my life told me I was worthless, and that's all. I'm just a convict and a, and a dope fiend, and I had nothing else to do in life but hurt people or be locked up. You think of anybody else in your prison life where you got that message that you are something and worthwhile? And oh, yeah. 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 Anybody else come to mind? Was yeah, Rex judge? Newton. Rex Newton. He was a psychologist. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, matter of fact, I just met with him Friday. Hadn't seen him in 20 years. Oh, really? And so, yeah, 40, 40 years ago, he was a very instrumental in starting me. But he, like I said, he couldn't reach me at that time. Mm -hmm. But but he found you. He was, yeah, it was a real nice meeting Friday, yeah. Mm -hmm. Emotional, yeah, that we're, we're happy we're both alive and happy to see where I'm going. And that I'm not all ate up with hatred and, and being a loser and, and, all, and fulfilling the, the idea that I was just a convict and a problem for society. Your relationship with your mom and dad, say a few words about that. Uh, with my mom, your it was. Your biological mom and dad. My mother uh, was very close. She raised me. My father bailed on me when I was five. And he was a Portland police officer as uh -huh. his father. And things uh, got and from us. From a background of police activity, you, you didn't turn out so good. Well, I was trying to get their attention. I realize that now. In hindsight, it's crystal clear I was seeking attention, especially from my father. Because uh -huh. I figured if I got arrested, he would be notified. So then he'd have to come talk to me. That never happened. I just got further and further into criminality. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, my mother raised me. We, uh, as far as the family, it fell apart finally when I was eight and we went to, we used to spend weekends with them. Mm -hmm. And during this one weekend, uh, other officers would show up at 10, 10 11 o'clock, they'd have their break. And you'd see six, seven cop cars whip up into Hillsboro at their house. And they'd come running in the house, playing country music, doing straight shots of Jack Daniels, mm -hmm. and singing, carrying on, and then, all right, let's go, we gotta catch some bad guys. And I remember my father always saying, make sure you got your throw down. I didn't know what that was mm -hmm. until I got home. And I asked my mom for the throw down. Obviously it was important because all the officers I had to have theirs before they left. Mm -hmm. So, okay, tell me, what's a throwdown? A throwdown is, is, is a weapon, is a pistol that's not got serial numbers. That if a suspect ends up shot in the process of being arrested, the throwdown would cover their actions. So some of the police that you uh, were involved with when you were small were not great examples about oh, being honest and straightforward. No, he paid uh, child support with cases of cigarettes and stolen items. So, yeah, I had a pretty distorted view about right and wrong as a child. How about your physical health? Oh, it suffered. Through the years? Yeah. Say a little bit about that. You were talking about it earlier before the camera started rolling. Well, at 16, uh, I entered reform school. Uh, I get there one day, the next day they take my blood. The day after that, they pull me into the infirmary and said I had hepatitis and I needed to be isolated. Where'd you get the hepatitis? That's, uh, it's, they said it from using drugs. Uh -huh. And that's, now that's real debatable because blood doesn't come, uh, blood tests don't come overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, you get blood tested, especially in an institution. So uh, when they told me that I had 10 to 20 years to live, I freaked out and then tried to escape and they beat me up, stuck me in isolation for two months and that's, that's how I ended up getting, my medical services was in a cage. So I was very frightened of medical people from that point until, you know, I'm still dealing with it. I'm going through Eastern medicine now to help address my medical issues. 
because mm -hmm. Western technology, uh, these folks uh, weren't interested in my health. How's Eastern medicine helping you? Dealing with me as a person, the whole person, and not just one, one symptom. I'm not a symptom, I'm a person. Uh -huh. And that means a whole lot. It's what's keeping me alive. Did you ever get married? Yes, I'm in my second marriage. We've been married now 17, going on 18 years. 17, 18 years. Yeah. She likes you? In spite of me, yes. <laughs> in spite of me, yeah. 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 Is she going to watch you on this program when she shows you? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. You want to yeah. say something to her? Look at that camera and say something to her. I what? love you and thank you for enduring my existence. <laughs> <laughs> enduring my <laughs> What a way of looking at your life. And, and how much longer are you going to be on this earth? Uh, until I'm not. I'm shooting for 120. So I got another 59 years. You're going to hang out with your friend Todd here? As long as possible. <laughs> okay. Uh, you have any children? Uh, possibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Prison uh, is no place to try to raise or start a family. And have you had any time to think about politics or political persuasions or your left, right, or Trump supporter or what? I support human beings. Human beings. That's political, yeah. isn't it? Uh, you'd have to be... Yeah, you can't be otherwise. Yeah, I I believe that the planet right now is in dire straits, and that we need more love and more compassion. We don't need more oil. We don't need more technology. Technologies we got, we need to use to become sustainable. Have you always been as bright as you seem to be right now? Oh uh, no. What's your IQ? I haven't a clue. You're pretty bright. Did you know that? I've been told. I'm a psychologist for many years, and I know how to do that pretty well. And just listening to you talk for a few minutes about so many things, you're a bright young man, young man. Thank you. I can see that because I'm 91, and you're just a kid. <laughs> yeah. A few days ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, uh, here's a final t tough question for you. I'm going to check your IQ now. What's the difference between sympathy and empathy? Like syphilis and shit? I mean, I, I can... It's a family program. I, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I can empathize <laughs> with somebody mm -hmm. and, and understand their feelings, but to sympathize, that is, it's, it's not healthy for somebody. But to empathize is to write, understand where they're coming from. And to sympathize kind of is you're detached from them looking down on I them. thought you were bright, but this sucker is something else, man. <laughs> right, that's a compliment. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm a sucker too. Uh, you have any memberships in uh, any social organizations that uh, come to mind? The Seven Step Foundation, mm -hmm. Phoenix Rising, uh -huh. is a uh, real instrumental right now in my recovery and health. And how long have you been involved with Seven Step? Since '92. Mm -hmm. So 27 years. That's a while. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they've been good for you. Uh, wonderful. <laughs> you know, it was a struggle. I went through uh, four coups inside. Well, yeah. We're yeah. political. Being part of a political organization, a club inside prison is political. Of course. Because uh, you're influencing people and they want you to influence them and direct their energies in a way that's healthy for the institution. Yeah. And good for others. Well, when I got to Seven Step, it was a good old boys club. You know, and let's hold hands and keep people busy, but let's not do anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I was there at a blessed time when there were others that had educations, and we took it from a good old boy school into a social service organization. At that time, only two people were leaving Seven Step in a year. We thought, well, Seven Step is to help people stay out. We're not using the system for what it was designed for. So instead of working just for Seven Step, we decided we're working for every person in the penitentiary that's transitioning. And now that's carried out into the community. And it's really showing some success with its ideas and thinking? Yes. There are people that have been out and are staying out, been out 20, 30 years, 40 years. How long has Seven Step been in existence? It started in 1963 in Lansing, Kansas, by, by a guy by the name of Bill Sands, who had done time in San Quentin and had went back and, and met some people in, in Lansing, Kansas, and they'd been been paroled, 
but they weren't released because they didn't have a job or a place to go. Mm -hmm. And back then in the state, the law in Kansas, you could be paroled, but you had to have a place to go and a job. So what he did was, that's, that's where mentoring, Seven Step was the first mentoring organization in the states that I know of, outside of the church. Mentoring is uh, the foundation of each one helping each one. You know, that yes. once I've got it, you know, as we said, it's my duty, you know, to reach out and help the next guy. I'm going to stop talking to you because you're so interesting. We can go on for three or four more hours. But anyhow, one more question for you. Do you uh, rem remember anybody from the past or uh, alive today that you particularly, particularly admired or look up to? Any names come to mind for you from your life? Uh, that, that woman that first met you in prison? Oh, Leah Sauer, yeah. absolutely. Is that one? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Charles Kaufman. Charles Kaufman. No. Yeah. That's a high compliment. No. Yeah. How long have you known Charles? 35 <laughs> years. Oh my gosh, 35 years. Yeah. Have you learned anything from him? Keep my <laughs> mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about we stop talking to you so we can All get right, and share some with Todd, yeah. Todd, yeah. And uh, since you've been on a number of times in the past, and I'm still trying to get you to come on and, and play my piano so I can sing for you, because he's been teaching me voice and, I know and music I, for a long I time. I need to get on it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I saw the things I learned about you, and I recognized a long time ago that you're a, a real chronic do-gooder, a chronic. <laughs> and no matter what she's involved with, he's always doing good for somebody. And I got more time with him than I have with you. So I'm having a sense of your, your depth and where you're coming from when you see now the difference between being a not a good person and doing good. And you do good all the time. Why is it do you do good? Because life's been good to me. You gonna give me some examples of that? When I first went to New York City, I knew no one. I got an agent, I'm playing piano in a honky-tonk bar. One Friday night, a man and woman came in and they didn't belong, they were dressed to the tens. The man, the bar was where they had work clothes, they had fights, they threw beer bottles, I'd get under the piano. But this couple <laughs> sat near the piano uh -huh. and they kept rocking around and mouthing words. They came back on Saturday, same thing, they left. I saw him again next Friday, and then it came Saturday night, and the, and the one man, the man said to me, um, have a drink with us, I had a Coke. I found out that he was a heart specialist in New York City, and his wife was a doctor, a gynecologist in New York City. Uh -huh. and they had no children, they were in their 50s. So the lady doctor said to me, did you ever think of going to Juilliard School of Music? I said, do you want to see my checkbook? and they sort of laughed, they left. They didn't come back for two weeks. The third week when they came back, I sat with them, they said, we got a deal. Because they heard you, you play. Yeah, they were sitting near the piano. Of course, of course, yes. And I was playing and singing. And uh, the doctor himself said, we have a deal. If you promise to practice your piano playing and your singing every day and don't work, we have four years of Juilliard paid for. Famous Juilliard? Money school. I said, well, that's fine, but you know, I have to pay rent and buy my clothes, I gotta eat. You will have an open checking account for all your daily expenses. That was Dr. and Mrs. Jerome Hetty. So they, they were your benefactors. I graduated. Uh -huh. Audition for the Metropolitan Opera because I was a high tenor, got in, and my landlord in New York said, I don't care what you sing, I want my money because the Met didn't pay a lot of money. <laughs> so I met this lovely girl from Germany, Gisla, and she was a ballerina, and we auditioned for Broadway and we got on. And then we lived together for 29 years of our marriage. She said, it's a piece of paper, I own you, you own me. I said, I, I agree with you. We both sang and danced on Broadway all those years, and our 30th year, she had cancer. Oh. <laughs> and passed away. 
So then I was 50 at that time. I said, okay, it's time to go. So I was having dinner with David Merrick, a big producer and margin girl champion who were the co big choreographers These on Broadway. Big napping, you're dropping those big names on me, man. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Please go on. Anyway, I said, I said, look, guys, I'm getting out. I'm gone. I have, she's gone. I'm going to leave. Where are you going? I said, I don't know. So Marge put her hands over my eyes, and it was a placemat of the United States. Mm -hmm. She said, you put your finger on that map. Wherever you put your finger, that's where you're going. We will each give you $1,000. Well, that's $3,000, and in 1979, $3,000 was a lot of money. For sure. So she did. I opened my eyes. I was on Oregon. I said, oh, my God, cowboys, Indians, dirt roads. I knew nothing about Oregon. <laughs> well, I took the money, and I... Uh, packed up and stopped in Illinois where my mother was and bought a restaurant and bar and uh, had a lot of fun there. Sold it in seven years and took off and came to Portland. Uh -huh. And Portland's been awfully good to me. So you've been some, some good fortune followed you wherever you went, huh? You know, I left home when I was not quite 18. I joined the 101st Airborne. 101st, that was a big, bad organization. Yeah, at that time. Screaming Eagles. Yeah. And uh, stationed in Germany. And I ran away from home because my grandmother, who raised me, wanted me to be a Baptist preacher. We lived in the Bible Belt. And when the day I found out she enrolled me in Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, I took off for St. Louis and joined the 101st. Yeah, I really had to get away from that. <laughs> yeah, but when I got there, my job assistant to the chief of chaplains of Europe. Couldn't I get said, away well, from I it. can run, but I can't hide. <laughs> God has his way, or her. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I wear this bracelet. It says, loving people because people matter. Loving people because People matter, and you do love people. You've illustrated that through the years. That's from a Night Strike, a group that I'm with. I go under the Burnside Bridge every Thursday night and that's set up a Portland. table uh -huh. and work with veterans, homeless veterans, find them home. homes, jobs, food, clothing, etc. How long have you been doing that? Five years. Five years. I've missed two nights in five years. Wow. Because that's my job. i got to be there. Nobody can fill it in. But you're kind of old, aren't you, for doing that kind of stuff? I beg your pardon? You're kind of <laughs> old. Oh. <laughs> oh. So it keeps him young. He's my mentor and following. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I have a lot of students. I teach piano and voice. Mm -hmm. But I've got several that I know that come from families that nowadays economy is so bad I know the families can't afford for these kids to take lessons, so I give them free lessons. I don't charge them because I've got that talent that God gave me, yeah. and I need to give it away because somebody gave it away to me when I went to school. You know, i got to tell a little story about you because I'm a, a, a veteran through World War II vet. i got a few years on you. And, uh, my wife and I were at the VA hospital here in Portland on, on Pell Hill, we call it. And you were playing the piano and and uh, s singing, and my wife started talking to you, and she got more information about you. And uh, make that story short, I got you on the show, interview you, and we got to know each other pretty much, and I discovered more about what a kind man you are, and our friendship developed. And in the meantime, you you decided, well, since you're old and retired. I'll teach you some music, and uh, we won't charge you any money. And I couldn't believe that. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not very well off at all, but uh, he, he's just, he, see, I'm speechless now because he's been so good to me, too. <laughs> just give it away. God gave me the talent. God gave somebody to educate me. And the only way I can pay it back is to do that. You're going to talk about, you, you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, uh, a young lady who is uh, 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 innovating a new kind of music nowadays. Oh, Julie. Julie. The Hales. She has started, every few years in America, the music changes. 
Yeah, you got ragtime, you got jazz, you got blues. This is a crossover, called crossover. It's spiritual. The, no, it's the basic modern, not the modern music, the new music we knew out of the 50s and 60s, flavor of that classed into classic music. Oh, yes. Now, this girl has a three octave range. I don't know if anybody knows what that means, but she's fabulous. And she's got her first uh, album coming out next month. And she has started this organization with this new move in music, and it's just going on like wildfire. It's all over the computer. She started a big organization now called Crossover. And you discovered her? She came for voice lessons and piano lessons. They lived in Vermonia. Every Saturday, her That's mom, her yep. dad, used to bring her to my house for lessons. She'd never say anything. She was very quiet. I thought, is this kid learning anything? She don't ask questions. Now she's 31. She's writing her own music, her own words, and singing her own songs. And she was on our show some time ago, and it took off from there, huh? Yeah. Her dad said, I want you to know this is your fault. I thought, oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back a little bit in, in your, ch your childhood. You were bo born in Kansas, was it? No, in the Ozarks in Missouri. In Missouri. Missouri, yeah. Uh -huh. And then the family. I, I was raised by my grandmother and my grandfather. And then they moved up into Illinois. And when I was in sixth grade, I wanted to learn to play the piano but I didn't have a piano. But somebody gave me a cardboard fold out and you open it up and I keep it on the kitchen table and never saw all the piano and I'd sit there and play those, learn to play those, those keys. keys. And you couldn't no, hear a darn thing. Couldn't hear a thing. <laughs> but in your mind. <laughs> but uh, then uh, I was a sophomore in high school and my mother bought me a grand piano. She bought you a grand piano? Yeah. Yeah. Because she I was, thought I, she had a call. I was in the South Morn High School with this small, small country town we were living in. And one day a guy knocked on the door and my grandmother went to the door and he said, who's playing and singing in there? And she told him, she invited him in. In the next town from us, a town called Alton, Illinois, across the river from St. Louis, Missouri, they opened up the first radio station, WOKZ. They offered me a Saturday morning program, half hour of playing and singing every Saturday on their new radio station. And I did that my sophomore year to my junior year, going to play, yeah. <laughs> there again was something somebody gave me. A blessing. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Grandma Hummy wrapped up in the churches. I was forever traveling with the evangelists in the summer times, pitching tents and playing the piano and singing. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know what I was doing. But you're still, you're still singing, still playing the piano, huh? Oh, yeah. So you're teaching, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So there's uh, an example of doing good for so many years. The grand piano at the VA hospital, I donated that. I donated that because I wanted to know. I got a new piano, so I gave that one to the VA hospital. Yeah. So you, 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 you somehow you're involved on finding pianos to give to people. I just I just Cut found one, one and got it tuned for the group called Teen Challenge out in Estacada. Mm -hmm. It's a recovery group. They needed a piano, so I found one, sent it out there, sent a tuner out there to tune it. Teen, it don't hurt. So Teen Challenge, that occupies you a number of days during the week and regularly <laughs> on Thursday evenings. Mm -hmm. In Portland, you wh talk about where you meet under the bridge in Portland. Oh, that's the river. that's uh, Night Strike. Night Strike. Night Strike. Okay, I got it yeah. mixed up. Teen Challenge is sponsored. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Night Strike. I told you, I've been doing it for five years. Okay. We meet at a church, and then we have all kinds of people come. We have a, a record of who's coming that night. We, now, last Thursday night, I think we had 150 volunteers to show up, and we serve hot food. Clothes, Clothing, dietary, shoes, or, uh, fingernail polish, haircuts, hygiene package, mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. all free. Now, I think we've got some uh, older kind of, uh, not as old as we are, uh, viewers who, who watch regularly. And 
I remember you told me some stories about some of the big names and celebrities through the years. One of my best ones died today. Doris. Doris Day. Doris Day. She's ninety-seven. Yeah. Uh, I think ninety-one. And you knew her. Uh, see I her playing the piano, and she's singing. <laughs> I, uh, I yeah. worked with Doris quite a while uh -huh. in New York City. Yeah. She was a sweetheart. Yeah. And so yeah. was um, Carol Channing. I was the dance captain in that show. With when I was doing doing Hello Dolly with Carol, uh -huh. I had a solo out front, and I looked out stage and out in a certain area with a guarded area was two people and I'm singing and I said, oh my God, I, I'm never going to stop singing. It was Jack and Jackie Kennedy. We. Yeah. You're fabricating all those stories. I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some other big names and through the years you learned all sorts yeah. of things and, oh. and you might Smothers se brother. censor yourself a little bit anyhow <laughs> with some of the stories that you whisper <clears> to me. <throat> But some of those celebrities and, and big names you mentioned in when your I was, career. When, when I had first gone to New York, an agent booked me in St. Louis to a place called Gaslight Square. It's about three blocks long of all restaurants and entertainment centers. Mm -hmm. And I was at Marty's Rendezvous. And I was his lead tenor. He had all just singing waiters and waitresses with the program. There's where I met Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand. And where I met Tommy and... and uh, his brother. This mother's brothers. <laughs> They're the ones that that helped me in New York. They got me into all kinds of things. This mother's brothers. Yeah. And of course there was of course when Gisa and I were doing Camelot with Bobby Goulet, um, we met Judy Garland in that time. Judy Garland. And that was in middle 50s I think I can't After. remember anyway she hadn't done anything in a while and she had just got evicted from the hotel I can't remember now the hotel where she was living with her kids so um, her agent said let's do a comeback we haven't done anything in a while so anyway, we found out Judy had nowhere to go and she was really twisted so we took her home with us, and she stayed with us 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. And Florence, Florence, Richard Burton's first life, Florence, opened up the first disco in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And Judy said, I want to go to the opening. So I took her, and she started going back every night for a couple. Of, one night she called and said, I'm not coming in. I said, what are you? She said, I'm with Florence. Two days later, she comes back. She's got this dude with her. It looks like her grandson. So what's going on, Judy? She said, come here. We're getting married. We're leaving for London tomorrow. I said, Judy, you know this boy for two days. Oh, but he loves me more than anybody ever loved me. I said, Judy, <laughs> they all loved you more than anybody ever loved you. They loved you for the money you can make, dear. Well, she went to London with him, and it was, oh, probably three weeks in the middle of the night. I got a phone call, and it was another one of the famous actresses, and she said, Todd, I'm sorry to call you so late, but I just got a wire that Judy's dead. Commit suicide. It was the biggest funeral I had ever seen. Mm -hmm. They were on blocks in New York City in that funeral. So later on, I found out that uh, the family had closure as far as they were concerned. The young dude that she married, oh, eat her. He thought she had money. He was. He had a lover in Manhattan, an older person, and their idea was for him to marry Judy and fleece her. Mm -hmm. And when they found out she had no money. Cold-blooded. She wasn't a very pretty sight at that time. She had real dark circles. I had bought her two wigs in New York because she was good and real bald from, from the drugs. Mm -hmm. So. And you have a whole history of those kinds of celebrities. I'm and writing a book. <laughs> you're still getting contact uh, some of those that are still alive, huh? Yeah. If somebody's going to thinking about going back on tour again, Barbara Streisand? She was thinking of going on tour again, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't know. She's getting up in the years. Barbara's in her 60s now. Uh -huh. Don't seem like I met her when she was 18. <laughs> 
just the other day. Just the other day. Yeah. Have you got any more examples of your doing good nowadays? I, I still work with people. Uh, I, I'm just recovering from my open heart surgery. It's been a year oh, now. And just I'm, a year. And I'm halfway through my liver treatment for my hep C. And so I'm, I'm mentoring. I, I, I work with a couple people a week. And uh, they just come out of the prison system. So I help them get to their parole office or to a job interview. You know, I get a little bit of gas and we'll... Yeah. And you're having some success with those people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, sometimes they'll fall down and just you know, understand it's not their time. But mm -hmm. I've, there's people now that I've worked with that are drug and alcohol counselors that have fabulous lives. Materially, uh, they're millionaires. And, but that's not my calling. I, I get more out of helping people. Besides the economic condition I'm under, but I'm, like I said, I'm not a victim. This is just the situation I'm in, and so I can't chase dollars, so I chase helping hearts. I wanted to tell you, when I first moved to Portland, I picked up two young men and a girl who were street kids, took them to my house, raised them, put them through high school. The girl next month is retiring from her job. She moved back to New York when she graduated to live with her aunt and uncle. She's been working at this hotel, the Algonquin Hotel in New York City. When she retires, she has been there as the assistant director for the last 10 years with a high school education from a five-star hotel. Wow. The one boy got mixed up back in 1995, got mixed with a young lady who was working for Fred Myers in drugs and as a pharmacist, and she got and we found him floating in the Columbia. The other boy has been at my house now 31 years. He's still there. He, he was on drugs and et cetera, et cetera, for years. Finally, at last, he met a lady, and he, the day he met her, he quit drinking and quit doing drugs. He went to college. He got an education as HVAC maintenance, and uh, that's what he does, and he's still living at my house, and he's clean and sober. 31 years. You do know how to rescue, don't you? <laughs> I, so I love it. Who's close to you in your life now anymore? You're so darn old, you've got very few people left around, huh? Yeah. So he is your adopted son? Yeah, sort of like, yeah. Because uh -huh. uh, uh, all my family is gone, and all he has is a mother, and she's not well. Mm -hmm. But he takes care of things for me. He does everything. I have this home he, with his education and what he does in construction. He takes he, take care of the furnace, the air conditioning, the yard, the house, the gutters. He does all that. Mm -hmm. uh, another thought, I know you got me turned on to uh, CBD. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're a devotee or something, uh, some sort of a, a flag waver for cannabis and like that. Huh? It's good in many ways. You look you look at it. Alcohol. You have murders, you have car wrecks, you have domestic violence, you have shootings. You don't see that with marijuana. You don't see people sh they I don't smoke. I don't smoke people do some smoke, okay. But when they're smoking they smoke the joint, slide down the wall and say, Let's have a Twinkie. There's no domestic <laughs> yeah, violence. Yeah, there's no violence there. <laughs> you see, the <laughs> thing is going to kill a But twinkie. the big thing right now, as I can see it, is the big farms. They are screaming and hollering with the government, no, 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 because it's dangerous, because they're selling. It's, it's going to, but it's, it's moving. It's moving yeah. quickly. That's going to be a whole new in industry nationwide, right? Yes. Well, the CBDs uh, that it was Todd helping is, it's, it's not the psychoactive part of the cannabis. Right. And this has taken people by storm because there, it's, uh, it, and it, it deals with our endocrine system, mm -hmm. our hormones and that. It helps putting our, it's like putting your body back on factory reboot. CBDs help your body, it helps everything get back to what it's supposed to be doing. 
It oh, fights cancer. Uh, it's wonderful. I don't go stuff. to sleep at night. The last thing I do is my CBD oil, four drops in yeah. a dropper and the water. And I'm, I'm not sure just for my general health, it's really working. I swear yeah. by it. It's helping my diabetes real well. You do well. CBD every day. I mean, yeah, I, I make my own balm, and uh, yeah, it's helped me tremendously. He makes a salve that if you got a pain of any kind, arthritis or anything, you just rub a little on there, go across there with it, just like that. That's it. Within a minute, all pain's gone. I use it all the time. And you make this stuff? Oh, it's just on the kitchen. Uh, you can make it on your kitchen counter. But as long as you're not selling it, you're not Oh, no, I, I give it away. Yeah. <laughs> well, then it's not psychoactive. You know, I'm no not question. selling THC, it's just mm -hmm. CBD. So, and uh, I, since I've been doing, doing it now, since I met you, I find it's, it's hard to pin down exactly whether it's working more in my arthritis and something else. But generally speaking, it's a tonic. Yeah, the way I see it's it just now. turning the the right things on at the right time. Well put. Where do you have arthritis? And your shoulders? Well, there's no no cartilage left in this shoulder for thirty years or so. Oh. But all the other symptoms seem to be uh, under control, and uh, and I think it's because of the CBD oil that I'm doing regularly. And is it, is it making me a better looking? Or? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love your friend, you know. <laughs> so, okay, uh, we want some more evidence of your doing good. What's, uh, what's doing good mean? What does that mean, to do good? I know we've been talking about it. To, but be, to be of do, help. Huh? To be of help. There's so many people that need help. And, and a lot of people get, uh, they resist help because they feel they don't deserve it or there's an ulterior motive. Mm -hmm. So there's sometimes, you know, I'll help people, but then I gotta step back. And I, I'm becoming mature enough now to help and step back and not be emotionally attached to what I'm doing. Because they might take what I do and crash. And then I get upset. And then I, I feel bad, and I don't want to hurt, I don't want to help nobody no more, but if they're just going to take what I, and throw it away. I give them and let it go. If they take it and waste it, so be it. It might not be their time, but I'm still going to help people. Sort of like you, huh? <laughs> yeah. You sleep good. Yeah, much better. Uh -huh. Why don't we get you two guys to run for politics and do something for those folks in Washington. I'd rather be behind the scenes helping people change <laughs> and they change the politicians because right now I they, think we're drowned in the corruption. Yeah. But there's always been corruption, isn't there? Been? Yeah. Mm. But it seems to be a lot. But it can be overcome. Love, love can overcome everything. That's why there's not enough hugs. If somebody held Trump down and gave him a hug in front of God and everybody, I think uh, I don't know if he'd be able to come out of it. <laughs> An official hug. Yeah. yeah. What was that song years ago? Love makes the world go round. Love makes the world go round. Love makes the world go round. Yep. La, da, 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 and da. when you show this to some people, you get criticized. There's something wrong with you. Yeah. Because you're being nice to them. There's some alter. You got to be up to something. You can't just be nice. Yeah. It's really nice because this is one of my favorite signs. Be kind to even unkind people. They need it most. And I wear it in public a lot. And it depends on where I'm going. I have about a collection of these signs, about 80 of them through the years. And each one's got a different flavor. And one of my great enjoyments in life is when I go into a supermarket or some public place and some little old lady sees my sign and she reads it and she looks up at me and then her eyes go all juicy and wet, especially with white hair. Yeah. And she says, can I hug you? That's, that's my enjoyment right there. Yeah. I, I really, and I'm, 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 I'm high for the rest of, of the hour or two. Yeah. Yeah. And I realize, like, see, I get more out of that than I've, I've, I've stole millions of dollars. And I can never get the feeling I get when I get that love and compassion connection that I help somebody and, thank you. I'm not looking for that thank you to me, but just thank you that their life's going to be a little easier. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm, yeah, my, I run on a different currency today than the greenback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks to Todd, I, I learned another way of uh, traveling in this world. So you, you got a, a whistle to let us know what tone to, to do this in, because it's time for us to do a kumbaya together, all three of us here. Kumbaya, kumbaya, my lord. Kumbaya, <laughs> oh Lord, kumbaya. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so goofy. Yes, we are. They're going to lock us up. <laughs> uh, for being happy and full of love. Yeah. I know. I wish to infect people with love. I got to tell you. Okay. You didn't ask me what would my best friend say. Oh yeah, what would your best friend say when I, I, I ask him? He would who say, is Todd? he would say, he's like the stars in the sky. You may not always see him, but he's there. <laughs> True. Now we are running a little low on time, but we don't have to stop just yet. So I want you to say to the audience anything that comes to your mind now. This is your time, and. Uh, why don't you go first and look at that comment and talk to the viewers about anything we talked about or anything else that comes to mind, just whatever. No matter where you've been or who you think you might be, there's always a chance to give love. Never let that chance go un untaken. Love everybody, especially your family and the planet. We need it. Yeah. Todd, it's your turn. Look don't at, hesitate. That, that one there, talk to that one. Don't hesitate to put your arms out and hug somebody because a hug means a whole lot to people. You go a day without a hug, you feel lonely, you feel lost. But when somebody walks up and hugs you, you know there's love and there's life and there's, a, there's things coming that you need. Yeah. Yeah, and I had a poem here that I don't find any more. Okay, so looks like we're stopping a few minutes early. I'm so surprised because we usually run out of time here. But uh, how about some public service announcements? Can we crank in a few PSAs uh, there? Oh, I want to tell you about The Nation. Go to that uh, website, thenation.org. It's an old lefty publication, a liberal publication that's been around for many, many years. It's the oldest one in the country, I think. And it talks about political and, and social issues in a positive way. And I think uh, the, the uh, okay, the SCLU, that's my favorite organization, the American Civil Liberties Union. God bless them. Yeah, God without, bless them. Without, God bless them. You God bless them. Without the ACLU, keep them strong. Man. Keep them, keep them alive. Yeah, yeah. And uh, to learn more about the Alliance for Democracy, that's another organization I belong to. The national website is the Alliance for Democracy dot org, and the Portland, Oregon website is at www.afd-pdx.org. I belong there, and uh, oh, we got an corporate personhood. Go to www.movetoamend.org to end corporate personhood. And that way you'll learn to corporations are not persons and money is not speech. Our country is being dominated by, by corporations. fictions. Fictions are dictating reality mm. and then printing greenbacks to justify it. And, you know, they need to get rid of the dollar and figure out another way for us to get around. Because right now people have mistaken wealth with greenbacks. Yeah. And greenbacks has nothing to do with wealth. The depression, we had hundreds of thousands, million people here in America. We had tons of material. The, the depression was because we were short of dollars. That's like saying we can't build because we don't have enough inches. Mm. It was an illusion. So people just got to realize that in, no matter how we go economically, if we reach out to one another, we can feed each other. And there's another way of going. Of course, I'm at odds with the political system, but story of my life. <laughs> you got any, any more thoughts? Any other celebrities you can uh, turn this on with? This gentleman wasn't really a celebrity. He was the uh, second missionary to go into Africa after Dr. Livingston. He had a quote that, that I live by every day. 
-hmm. It said, if in a vision fair you could see the man that God had meant, then in a vision fair you would be the man you are and content. Oh, man, you got to do that again. Simple words, mm -hmm. but deep thoughts. All right. Even Dr. Livingston had a hard time holding up to that. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. So, I want to read to you about the move to a men organization, how that came about. Since the Supreme Court in March 2009 announced their decision that corporations are to be recognized as persons with the same constitutional rights as real human persons, tens of thousands of outraged citizens throughout the country have realized the need to amend the U.S. Constitution so that it clearly specifies that personhood rights shall be granted to only real flesh and blood persons and not to corporations and that money is not speech. They have signed various move to amend petitions circulated in the, their areas to express their sentiments to their government representatives. Please join this movement and now to take back our country from the grasp of the corporatocracy and save this beautiful experiment in democracy called the United States of America. Uh, I like talking about corporate personhood, yeah. Of course, I'm a little lefty from way back. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> and one of my heroes, of course, has been uh, FDR. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And I think I'm a Democratic Socialist, and Bernie Sanders, I think, is going to be the next president. And who do you think is going to be the next president? That's one I'm hoping for. How about you? I don't know. Him and, and, and Cortez, that lady from uh, New York. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. She's a firebrand. <laughs> I love her. Yeah. And oh, she speaks truth to power. Yes. And she's not asking for anything that's not ours. We're human beings. We deserve what she's asking oh, for. Oh, and now i got to say thanks for watching to you viewers out there. And remember, KFC, not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. Don's <laughs> KFC. Kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable. To you too, and you too, and you too, and you too, in the control room. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.